we lift our voices to the Lord this morning. We share our praise and we give our worship to our God. Are you ready to sing along and join with us? It's good to see you this morning. We're really glad that you're here. Fill it with our praise. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you.
God is great, full of compassion and mercy, and we his creatures, we his created beings, can sing of his love. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the heal us and be free. I'm happy to be in the and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing. But when you're looking out, I can sing of your love forever. 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 I know, I know. When the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like the dancing now. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love. you pray with us this morning? God, we can sing of your love. One of the most poignant symbols of your love for us is the cross, Lord. It's an image of suffering, of a mind that is resolute to endure motivated by love. And so we focus our minds on the cross now as we, this day, in a little bit, prepare to take communion as well, Lord, and, and remember your suffering and remember the sacrifice. It should cause us to be humbled, to be in awe of a everlasting, infinite creator who would humble himself 
and lower himself to go to the cross for his creation, to provide a way, to make a way, to bring hope and salvation, sanctification and justification, Lord. We're in awe of who you are. And we remember the cross and we give thanks.
you turn to someone next to you, you shake their hand and say, it is lovely to see you this morning. Rosie's gathering. Ha, ha, ha. Good morning. Should I go back there and start all over again? That'd be kind of fun. Who said no? That was really loud. <laughs> My goodness. New year and no manners. Um, Monday, tomorrow, we have a refreshments at Rosie's gathering. There's two times that that happens on those Mondays, so check the bulletin for that. I want to remind you, ladies, that that is coming up tomorrow. Coming up this week also, Wednesday morning at 8.30, excuse me, 9.30, we're going to start the undecorating process of all of our Christmas festivities, particularly up in Fellowship Hall. So come on in. There's going to be coffee ready for Ms. Shar. Uh, we'd love to have you help just kind of get it all down, get it done in one day. That's coming up Wednesday. Saturday, there is a men's breakfast. We want to invite all the men of all ages to be here. That's at 8, up in Fellowship Hall. Um, let us know if you're coming. If you intend to come, stop by the, um, the clipboard out there at the community center so we can have enough food prepared for you. Um, that'd be a really awesome thing. Sign up for that. That's coming up this Saturday. Then, next Sunday, a week from today, a couple things. After the service, there's going to be a Lord's Supper gathering up in Fellowship Hall. But also, during the worship service this coming Sunday, we have a baptism service planned. So you still have time if you're interested in that. Come talk to me after service or talk with Pastor Paul as well. We'll connect with you during the week on what it means, how it works, what that day looks like, so you can prepare and your loved ones to celebrate that step in your journey as a Christian. This Sunday, we did start today already up our Believe study groups again. We met in the Fellowship Hall and other places. The youth were downstairs. Those are up and running again. If you're not sure if your group is still going or not, or the details, contact your group leader. But it's kicked off again. We're back into that wonderful series. A whole new section of the Believe study has started up today. We want to remind our ministry leaders, real fun, fancy announcement, your uh, annual report for our business meeting that's coming up at the end of the month. There's chili, by the way, after that. It's going to be great. Sign up to bring chili. But ministry leaders, get your reports in by the 15th to the office so we can get everything compiled and ready for our fancy, handy-dandy report that we issue out to the Centerpoint family each year. All right, that's all my announcements for today. So I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward for the offering. Again, I encourage you to drop these cards in there. Let us know how we can pray for you. You can put that on the response card where it says, I need prayer. We love praying for you, but we'd love to pray for you as you start out a new year as well. I hope you've taken the time recently to rewind your 2017, to see where God showed up in the good and the bad and in the everyday. I hope that 2018 is pointing you towards that, whether it's calm, whether it's chaotic, or whether it just is. Be on the lookout for God to show up for you this year. We're going to take our offering as we worship God so we can further the work here to point to him in 2018. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for today. Thank you for the start of a new year and the fact that you show up new every single day, like you said in your word. 
I pray that you'll take this uh, act of worship here with our offering, and you'll continue to do much of the same. Spread your love, lift up the name and message of your son, and enable this ministry and this group of believers in this community to do amazing things for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. sharing with that uh, worship team earlier, this song that we're, gonna, that we're doing now, uh, is one that I really resonate with. Of course, there's not too many songs that we do that we don't resonate with, but um, this song, in my opinion, isn't um, all just happy, happy. Joy, joy. Not that there's anything wrong with happy, happy, joy, joy songs. But uh, it speaks of difficulty and um, trouble that it surrounds. Uh, and um, dark times and trial. And so, I don't know about you, but in my life I have difficulty. I have times of uncertainty and times of shadow and going through the valley. And so I can relate to the words of this song. I hope that you can too. And how it represents a crying out to God that no matter the difficulty, we know that God is with us and we know that he is always by our side. Would you like to stand with us? My foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm.
Good morning. As is our history, tradition, custom, plan, the first Sunday of every month, and this being a special first Sunday, first Sunday of the new year, we gather together to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, you don't have to be a member of this church family to partake, but you do have to be a member of God's family. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27, it says, So a person who eats bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is not worthy of it will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Look into your own hearts before you eat the bread and drink the cup, because all who eat the bread and drink the cup without recognizing the body eat and drink judgment unto themselves. That is why many in your group are sick and weak and some have died. But if we judged ourselves in the right way, God will not judge us. But when the Lord judges us, he disciplines us so that we will not be destroyed along with the world. Men, as you prepare to come forward, church family, let's take a few minutes and examine our hearts and prepare for the Lord's Supper. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can meet together to remember the sacrifice that you so freely gave. And Lord, as we take this time in remembrance in our worship service, may we not forget that it was your willing sacrifice that allows us the confidence and the assurance that we will see you in heaven in all your glory. Amen. Mark, would you pray for the cup, for the bread, please? Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, um, as we remember the price 
Lord, the extreme price that was paid um, by your suffering, your torture, so that we may live forever, Lord, and have that salvation, that promise. Lord, we just come together and we thank you so much for the price that you paid for us. In Jesus' name, amen. While they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread and thanked God for it and broke it. Then he gave it to his followers and said, Take this bread and eat it. This is my body. Jeff, would you pray for the cup? Lord, we come before you and uh, we thank you for this time that we can reflect on uh, your sacrifice. Lord, we think of the blood that was shed on our behalf. Lord, that uh, we did not deserve that. But even though you sacrificed for us, Lord, we thank you for that love and what it means. We just ask that you'd bless this cup now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus took a cup and thanked God for it and gave it to the followers. And he said, every one of you drink this. This is my blood, which is the new agreement that God makes with his people. This blood is poured out for many to forgive their sins. I tell you this, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Take, drink ye all. And all God's people said, Amen. Pastor Paul. Good morning and Happy New Year. <clears throat> Before we get into the message, I wanted to uh, bring you an update uh, concerning our dear Paul Rosentrader. Many of you were aware uh, that uh, last Sunday, uh, Paul suffered a stroke, and he's been in the hospital all week. Um, I was talking with uh, his son Dan yesterday, uh, Dan and Linda, many of you remember them. Um, Paul's been put in hospice. Um, he's at Collier's, which is the one over near Lutheran Hospital. Um, he's currently unresponsive. I had a great talk with Paul earlier this week, at least. The stroke affected his throat, and he couldn't talk. And for Paul, that's a, that's a struggle. And so... Uh, um, I don't know how much longer he's going to be here, but if you want to stop in uh, and uh, leave a message, um, I think the family would be blessed by that. But Paul's a dear man. I'll miss him. All right. Father God, we thank you for opportunities to see your hand at work. We thank you as well for the strength to face whatever comes our way, whatever comes the way of those we love. We thank you that your faithfulness is to the clouds and beyond. We thank you that your love is immeasurable and that your grace is always sufficient. So we enter the final part of this morning seeking to worship. Thank you for the opportunity to meet you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, we begin the second part of our Believe series, and we're going to be answering the question for the next 10 weeks, what should we do? In light of what we believe, of how we think, how then are we to act? You may remember the first section of the Believe series focused on ten key beliefs. God, salvation, the Bible, the church, and more. It answered the question again and again, what do we believe and why does it matter? Folks, these key beliefs that we have talked about determine the outcome of how we choose to live our lives. However... There is a difference between believing something as a right answer and believing something as a way of life. Do you understand? There is a great difference. The first resides in the head only, and the latter resides in the head and the heart. Beloved, spiritual understanding, spiritual growth begins by understanding God's truth in our minds, but it cannot stop there. We must embrace those truths in our hearts. When these beliefs take up residence in our soul, they will help direct our actions as well as influence who we become. So, the question I want to ask for the next 10 weeks, beginning this morning, 
How do we transfer biblical beliefs from the head to the heart, from thinking to actions? Well, the primary means is one many of you are involved in. It's by engaging in biblical practices, in biblical disciplines. When as Christians we engage in these practices, these disciplines on a routine and consistent basis, a wonderful transformation occurs in our lives. God begins to to build in us, and what he's doing on the inside begins to show on the outside. But this transformation, my friends, cannot be done on our own. The abiding presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives empowers us as we yield to his influence and his coaching. Because he resides in our spirit, he can speak directly into our lives. He can bypass all of our excuses, all of our rationalizations, all of our reasons for not wanting to do what he wants us to do. Folks, it's the presence of God that moves us into right actions, right choices. Someone said, right beliefs in the mind become outward expressions from the heart. As we learn about these amazing, life-changing spiritual practices in the weeks ahead, I want to challenge us to embrace them, to make it our goal to put on our our spiritual tennis shoes, as I speak, and give it our best effort to put these things into regular practice. The first key practice that we're going to look at this morning is one that lies deep in my heart. It's the practice of worship. A simple definition, it's on your outline. Hopefully you got an outline on the back of your bulletin. You might want to pull that out. Simple definition for the practice of worship is attributing worth to someone or something. We had a great gathering this morning for our Bible study. It started at 845. Some of you weren't here. Some of you forgot to come, perhaps. I hope you will come back. We've got a lot of things to study every Sunday morning at 845 up in Fellowship Hall. My friends, worshiping God is not an earthly event we attend. Think about that. Worshiping God is not an earthly event we attend, but rather a heavenly activity we take part in. It's not passive. It's participatory. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. It's not simply a mood. It's a response. When we worship God, We celebrate him. We boast about him. We sound our praises to him. I like how author Ron Allen puts it. Listen to this. Worship is not the mumbling of prayers or the mouthing of song lyrics with little thought and less heart. We celebrate God when all people and all parts of the service work together toward the common goal of bringing glory to God. Worship is not grudging gifts or compulsory service. We celebrate God when we give to him hilariously and serve him with sincerity. Worship is not haphazard music done poorly or even music done well as a performance. We celebrate God when we enjoy and participate in music done to his glory. He is the only audience that matters. Worship is not a distracted, and this one hits close to home, so hang on to this one. Worship is not an endurance of the sermon. Amen? Oh, we need to hear that there. It's not an endurance of the sermon. We celebrate God as we hear his word gladly and seek to be conformed more and more and more into the image of our Savior through its hearing. Worship is the first discipline of the Christian life that helps the key beliefs move from our head to our heart. For Christmas this year, I received a book on worship from my son Jonathan and his wife Allison. Now, 
got to understand, I've spent many years reading all kinds of books about worship, studying and teaching about it. And my first thought was, i got to be honest, I doubt there's anything new in there for me. But their recommendation was so positive, I decided to give it a read. Guess what? I thoroughly enjoyed it. The book is entitled, it's a little teeny book, it's entitled Holy Roar. It's written by Chris Tomlin and Darren Whitehead. Many of you know Chris Tomlin as probably the premier worship leader and songwriter in America today, and Darren Whitehead is a worship pastor from Australia. I recommend this. In fact, you're going to hear a bunch about it today. I believe God sent this to me in light of today. The book focuses on seven Hebrew words from the Psalms, which are all translated into the single English word praise in our Bibles. Each of these words has a distinct, important, and I believe worship-altering implications. In fact, from this message, I hope you'll be inspired to express your praise to God with renewed joy and enthusiasm. So we're going to look at those seven words. The first one from Hebrew for the word praise is the word yada. Say it with me. Yada. Don't, don't you sound more close to, to biblical thinking when you speak Hebrew? Yada. You can say that anytime you want. Oh, yada. It means to revere or worship with bodily actions and gestures that accompany praise. Actions like extending one's hands. Actions like, like throwing something up in the air because you're celebrating. I wanted to bring some confetti, but I feared Ray's wrath. So just know, I'm throwing confetti just figuratively. All right. In the context of praise, Yada describes those moments when the Hebrew people were so overcome by the glory of the Lord that their hands shot up in praise, much like touchdown. I see it. I've been to Bronco Stadium. When the Broncos score, what does everybody do? Let's try it. <laughs> Touchdown! Yeah! I mean, everybody's doing it. Why? Why? Because it's acceptable. It's the right response. It's what we should be doing because the Broncos scored. Touchdown. Folks, that's yada. That is yada. Listen. God's touch on our lives came about only when he came down to our level. And for that, we must praise him forever. That's the true touchdown. In Psalm 67, 3, the psalmist penned a song of praise for the people. The text reads, May the peoples praise you, yada you, God, May all the peoples yada you. Now, understand, this psalm was certainly written for the Hebrew people, but I think there's an implication there that goes broader than that. In fact, I think all peoples, whether they're Hebrew or Greek or anything in between, were to raise their hands to God in praise. Let me continue. In Psalm 44, 8, the psalmist wrote, in God we make our boast all day long, and we will praise, we will yada your name forever. As you can see, yada is not constrained to a particular time in history. It says forever. It's an eternal verb, one that transcends denominations. One that transcends time and space and place. One that transcends our upbringing. One that transcends even our bodies. One day, we all will yada our God in praise. Let's look at the second word of praise. It is halal. Say it with me. 
Halal. All right. It means to boast, to rave about, to admire, to shout joyfully, and I think the favorite one of small children, to make noise. Halal is the primary, the most used word for praise in the Psalms. It's the term from which we derive the word hallelujah. It's an exuberant expression of celebration. And it carries with it the notion of laying aside one's inhibitions. Boy, that's hard for us conservatives, especially some of us who grew up Baptists, to think about, isn't it? Laying aside your inhibitions. Oh, my goodness. Well, that was cool. Because Psalms of Halal were meant for corporate worship. Let's consider what a celebration might look like using Psalm 149.3. Take a look. It says, let them praise his name. Let them halal his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. Imagine the, the great throng of Hebrew people all gathered together. The Levites are singing. The musicians are playing their instruments. And as the songs rise, a synergy begins to grow among the worshipers until some spark of God ignites their praises. And in that moment, the people begin to jump and they begin to shout and dance and they're all lifting their hearts and their hands to God in praise. Now to the outside observer, they might appear drunk, or at least foolish. But know this, they are most sober in their halal worship of God. Folks, the God of the universe made us to praise him with abandon. You know, sometimes... I wonder if, if God looks down on the North American church and he sees our, our carefully orchestrated worship experiences and he wishes that we would just cut loose. Wishes that we would step out of our own habitions onto his great dance floor. Setting aside our dignity and more accurately, our pride. The next word of praise is the word zamar. Let's say that together. Zamar. Zamar is used throughout the psalm to denote the, the making of music, celebrating in song and music, and plucking the strings of instruments. In Psalm 144.9, the psalmist wrote, I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a harp of ten strings, I will sing Zamar to you. I know this to be true. Maybe you don't, but I know this to be true. Music is more powerful than we understand. It can soften our hearts. It can soothe our troubled souls like nothing else. Know this, it can also open the door to the spiritual world and pave the road for the Spirit's presence in our life. Some believe David wrote Psalm 57 while he was hiding in a cave in the desert, avoiding King Saul. In it he wrote this, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing Zamar. David recognized the truth, the truth that music can, can bolster the human heart, that it can fill us with courage to exercise, to continue in the faith. Now, I know this to be true as well. We're not all able to play the piano or the guitar. I, I can't play, my wife can play, my son can play, and some of us can't carry a, a tune in the bucket. Maybe the shower, but not in a bucket. But that doesn't mean we can't engage in zamar. Listen, as we listen to music, 
Can't we see the, the way that it prepares souls to receive God's word? Can't we appreciate how it carries our praise into the very throne room of God? Folks, when we appreciate that and notice that, we are participating in Zamar. The fourth Hebrew word for praise is the word Tuda. Tuda. Let's say it together. Tuda, not Tada, Tuda. It means an extension of the hand in thanksgiving for what God has done. I like that, but look at the rest of this. It also means a sacrifice of praise for things not yet received. It's praising God with expectation. The psalmist used to dah as an expression of confession, a way to convey his trust in the goodness of God. Psalm 56 was written by David after he was captured by the Philistines. Despite his circumstances, here's what he wrote. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render toda to you. David, think of it. Captured by the enemy, uncertain about his future, praise the Lord. What for what? For the promise of deliverance he had not yet received. That's praising God with expectation, is it not? In Tuda, we lift our hands in the presence of God, not only for what he has done, but also for what we believe he will do. Folks, he will provide what we need. He's promised. So we lift our hands in praise. He will heal us both now and in eternity. So we lift our hands in praise. He will release us from whatever bondage we're struggling with. So again, we lift our hands heavenward in praise. My friends, when we lift our hands heavenward, you know what we're doing? We're pointing to the very place of our ultimate hope. <laughs> My children are still living with us for a while yet. And one of the wonderful blessings is that little granddaughter of mine. I should have put a picture of her because of her, she's just the cutest thing. Looks like her grandmother, thankfully. The thing I love that I'd forgotten when my little boy, when my boys were little, was she'll walk into the room and she'll look at me and she'll do this. What do you do to that? <laughs> Who of you walks away? <laughs> it's impossible. This morning, as we sang always, I felt like the little granddaughter lifting hands to my great father in heaven and reciting those words and the tears began to come to my eyes because I need that connection. I need to know he's there and reminding me today, this morning, David, thank you, that he is always there, bolsters my spirits, lifts my heart, and it helps me to remember that no matter what comes, because I don't know what's coming, he's going to take care of me. He's going to be there for me. The fifth word describing our praise is the word barak. Barak is how we say it. Say it with me. Barak. Barak. In bodies, the notion of, of kneeling before God of blessing and adoring him, of recognizing, this is key, of recognizing our position before him. It's used 289 times in the psalm. And in each, and in each occurrence, and this is so cool, it's in, it shows and describes worshipers falling on their faces before God. In reverence, in adoration, and in thanks. When's the last time you fell on your face before God and it wasn't accidental? 
Sometimes we do it figuratively. We may not, accident, we may not actually find ourselves in that position, but we are so overwhelmed or so thrilled. And we come to the Lord with Barak in Psalm 72. Solomon uses it to describe the ways the kings of the nations will bow to the ultimate and one and only king. Look at Psalm 72. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be barak. In Barak, even the most powerful lay aside their egos. Even the most powerful lay aside their power, their desires, their gold, their prayer, their honor, even their gaze. I often wonder how our church gatherings might feel if Sunday after Sunday, we were all to come into this place with the eyes of our souls focused on the king. Nothing else, no one else, focused only on the king. And I begin to wonder, would we complain about the temperature? Would we complain about the music, the song selection, the volume? Would we complain about anything? If our eyes are focused solely on him, if we bowed down, eyes only on the king, would we care about anything? I think you know the answer. My friends, if we've experienced the goodness of God, and I have, if we've seen his work in our lives, in the lives of our friends, in the life of our church here, how can we not barak? How can we not but fall on our knees in gratitude and praise with our eyes fixed on him. Beloved, when we come into the presence of God together, our sole focus must be the king. The sixth word of praise is tehillah. Say it with me, tehillah. Tehillah is a word that means a hymn, a song of praise, or a new spontaneous song. Now, the book of Psalms is basically that. It's a collection of these kinds of songs. Now, they may not all rhyme. They may not have the catchiest tunes. But here's the issue. They come from the worshiper's heart. And often, they are a spontaneous song that's in the moment, such songs flow out of an intimate relationship with God. Psalm 22, 3 uses the word tehillah. It says this, Yet you are holy, O Lord. You, O you who are enthroned upon the tehillah of Israel. Listen. When we offer new Spontaneous songs of praise. The Lord steps from his heavenly courts and takes up residence among his worshipers. It says God inhabits the praise of his people. That means he's enthroned upon it. Now here's a question I bet I know the answers to most of us here. Have you ever lifted a spontaneous song of praise to God? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Have you ever done that? Let me take it a step further. Have you ever found yourself so overwhelmed by God's work in your life that you can't help but lift up a song, a word, a shout of praise to him? Have you been there before? Well, if you haven't, I want you to consider your story, your history with the Lord. The ways that God is at work in your life today and lift a spontaneous song to him. The words don't have to rhyme. You don't even need to be able to carry a tune. Even if you don't know what to sing, try raising a new song to God. It may be awkward at first. It will be awkward at first. 
But if you do, you will discover this truth. God will inhabit your act of praise, your tehillah. God will inhabit your simple act of praise. The last Hebrew word of praise is shabak. Say it with me, shabak. It means to address in a loud tone, to shout, to commend, to glory, or to declare victory. In Psalm 63, David penned a song of praise while he was in the wilderness. Here's what he wrote. It says, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will shabak you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Folks, listen. Even in the dry desert places, David resolved in his heart to live out his life by lifting a shout of praise to God. Now, this shout of praise is not just a personal dedication or a personal declaration. Psalm 117 says, For nations are to raise a holy roar. The psalmist wrote, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Shabak him, all you people of the earth. The most memorable, at least in my history, of a cultural Shabbat happened when five million people gave a full-bodied, full-volume shout at the top of their lungs. It was a unified, colossal roar. The location? Hutchinson Field at Grant Park in downtown Chicago. The occasion? You know, the Chicago Cubs finally winning the World Series. It's like a weight had been lifted and the whole city gave this huge roar. This shout gives us an example of Shabbat. Every time we gather together as God's people to praise him, one voice unites with another. Songs become anthems. Anthems become declarations, and declarations become a holy roar. Folks, this holy roar is not just for a particular people in a particular time and in a particular space, and neither is it praise for the purpose of pumping up the crowd. That's not it at all. Shabbat is for the purpose, listen, the purpose of passing on our faith to the next generation. Did you realize that? It's for the purpose of passing on our faith to the next generation. In Psalm 145, 4, the psalmist wrote, One generation shall praise your works, shall mock your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. Brothers and sisters, the next generation is waiting for the sound of Shabbat. The shout of praise needs your voice. Let me wrap this up. Maybe you found yourself a little outside your comfort zone in some of these acts of praise that I've described this morning. Perhaps you're uncomfortable with with lifting your hands to God. Perhaps you're uncomfortable with busting a move of kneeling or raising a shout. Maybe you couldn't see yourself actually singing a a spontaneous song to God. If you found yourself feeling that way, I want you to know this. It's okay. It's okay. God knows where you're at. Even though, listen, he wants you to grow in your expression of praise to him. But know this too. God desires your full and free expression of praise. He says it again and again, over and over in Scripture. A man told a story about his son's sixth birthday. His son was usually very specific about the gifts he would like to receive, but this year his request was just a bit different. He said, Dad, 
I'd like a ball to play with on my birthday. His dad asked, well, what kind of ball? The son replied, if you have some time to play ball with me this year, dad, I'd like a football so we could throw it back and forth in the yard. But if you're going to be real busy, I'd like a soccer ball because I can play soccer with the kids in the neighborhood. The dad talked to his wife and they agreed. Their son was not so much interested in the gift. He was most interested in the giver of the gift. True worship is not interested in the created, but in the creator. Worship is not about us. It's not about what we want or like. It's about God, what he wants and what he likes. And I hope this morning I've given you a glimpse into what the Lord is looking for from these seven words of praise found in the psalm. Father God, we give you our thanks. We give you our praise. And we ask that you continue to help us be people that respond with praise instead of fear. That we live outside of our own issues and begin to see who you are and how we can respond in a way that is worshipful. Oh, Lord, help us to live lives of worship. May it reflect in every area of our lives. We thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. stand with us. We'll let you go this morning with this last song of praise and worship. Let's lift our voices together. How great is our God. The splendor of the King Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great.
door will see how.